This storm was very unpredictable. I don't know what to do with myself. We lost it all. Hurricane Ian ravaged the West Coast. I thought we were going to die. Every day is a busy day trying to recover. The cleanup continues. What's the future look like for you? A lot of uncertainty. As hurricane season starts. It's a monster impact to the community and we will rebuild. Now it's time to prepare. How long does it take to do your whole house? What do you need to have in your disaster preparedness kit? Now a WPBF 25 first warning weather special. Hurricane ready with Chief Certified Meteorologist Chris Martinez. This is the coastal town of Matt Lachey, one of the islands hardest hit by Hurricane Ian in southwest Florida back in September. The 155 mile an hour winds along with the deadly storm surge knocked out two lifelines that day. The Matt Lachey Bridge and Sanibel Causeway trapping people for days. Fort Myers, Cape Coral and Naples were also hit, leaving hundreds and thousands without power. Close to 150 people were killed it was the third costliest hurricane on record after Katrina and Harvey. The rebuild in the aftermath of Hurricane Ian is very slow, but the community has banded together to help restore their homes, their businesses, and their lives. It was horrifying. It was completely horrifying. This is where the house began. Tracy Wentz has lived on exactly. Curlew Drive for years. But it took just minutes for her home to be destroyed. At one point, I texted my family and said, I'm sorry, I love you, because I thought we were going to die. Our house was demoed the Monday before Thanksgiving. And you're still without power? Still without power. We're running on generator. Wentz is like a lot of people, waiting months on FEMA money, temporary housing, and backlog permits. What's changed since then? Nothing, nothing. This is where we're staying, right? What we're living. For now, um, she sits and waits a in a tiny here. rental trailer with her husband. Um, right now, we kind of still have stuff to put away. Our kitchen. Um, the only thing we really can use right now yet is the microwave because propane. Um, we freeze things in the freezer and then put them in the refrigerator so that way it lasts while we're at work. You've been through the storm surge, you've been through the wind, and you've seen the devastation. You've lived it for the past almost eight months, and you still want to rebuild. You know why? Because we have the best community on this island. We all pulled together and helped each other, and I don't think I could leave that. Despite the onslaught of Hurricane Ian, Many Floridians have made the choice to rebuild. This island was cut off from the storm. With the help so of people the, like Aaron Bereda with the Greater Pine Island Alliance. I think for a lot of people, it's a matter of money and resources. A nonprofit organization designed to help victims with long-term recovery efforts. Right now, people are waiting for building materials and supplies. So whether if their home was salvageable, uh, their siding's hard to get, you know, drywall, limited supplies coming in. And so there's a lot longer lead times with a bunch of the contractors working out here, not to mention the price increase, which makes it harder and harder. What's the future look like for you? I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty. Obviously, um, knowing that we need to come in and do a seawall and put docks in and put an ice house and again, everything that makes us a fish house. The part that's most devastating is you're gonna lose the culture, you're gonna lose the history. And when these fisheries fail, like my shop, when it fails, I'm much more valuable property-wise not being part of the fisheries. Casey Streeter is the owner of the once bustling Island Seafood Market in Matt Lachey. Look, we worked for over 10 years, seven days a week, and in a matter of 10 hours, it was all gone. Our island's got our road, so it's a start. We got about a two-foot sand dune in our parking lot. Here's what we're working with in here. Every day, crews come to haul away what's left of the business. This is our working waterfront or what's left, the last of what's left of my, my docks. All while knowing they've already been denied for disaster assistance this year. It's really not help when help comes five years later. It's going to be a big lift, but we'll, we're going to find a way. We're, we're gritty people, so we'll make it happen. While Ian was battering the West Coast, officials in Palm Beach County were watching the devastation unfold more than 100 miles away. And it seems like this all around me that county officials want to avoid so they urge you to prepare early. Right off a of military trail in Gun Club Road in West Palm Beach is the heart of emergency management and disaster preparedness for Palm Beach County. 
What exactly is in this room? Well, this is our emergency operations center, and this is what we consider our operations room. So all of our partner agencies and county responding agencies work from this room when we have an activation. A room that is abuzz days before a hurricane even threatens. So in this place, you really have representatives from all facets of the county. Absolutely. This room is designed to be the main hub for county coordination, collaboration, and communication. So many solutions being discussed before any problems arise. But with an influx of new people to the county rises a new challenge this season. I'm concerned that maybe these new individuals that have moved into our community or even those that those that have been here a long time haven't taken time to be prepared. It's so important as we have a storm approaching that individuals are prepared. And to be prepared, you have to be aware of all impacts a storm may bring. Individuals need to understand that it's all of those individual hazards that make up a hurricane, whether that be the threat of tornadoes or flooding. So individuals need to take the, the time to understand how those hazards could impact where they live and how they would respond to it, whether they're in an evacuation zone, whether they're in a flood zone. And knowing that communicating those hazards and information to you is crucial, the EOC has a quick free way to bring them to you by signing up. This room actually launches, we have a mass communication system that we use for public safety emergencies called Alert PBC. Individuals can go to alertpbc.com to register and any public safety emergency that would impact you at your home or your place of business, whatever you register, um, that information comes directly out of this, this office here. Mary Blakeney also wants to stress it's not just hurricane season you need to get ready for. So when we tell people to get prepared now, it's not just for hurricane season, it's for year round, whatever may happen to you. Now is the time to be prepared. If everybody is prepared, the amount of stress and the ability to recover quickly um, is greater for our community. This is how you can find out if you're in an evacuation zone. Click on the Know Your Zone map, type in your address and see if you're in a flood area. If you are in an evacuation zone, listen to orders from your local officials. You can find this map on WPBF.com. Getting your home prepared for a storm can feel overwhelming, but there are many things you can do right now before you have to take action. Meteorologist Glenn Glazer has a tour. I know this is about hurricane season, but there's something that people should know about for any time of year. When we have any kind of severe weather, it's super important to know which room in my house is the safest room in the house? Yeah, you, you should actually have an awareness yeah. of your actual home. And this is the safest room in this particular house. So okay. what you wanna look for um, in the event of an approaching storm yeah. or even a, a potential tornado warning yeah. is you wanna find the safest room in your house. And mm -hmm. how you can identify the safest room in your house, you really wanna focus on a room that has no exterior windows or walls. Right. So it just so happens that this restroom is in an interior portion of the house. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and this would be the safest room within this house, inside the envelope of the home. And in the event that you need to go in that safe room, you want to bring in all your supplies with you. Bring in some of your disaster supplies, bring in your portable radio. We also have ready to go all the time at my house. My kids have a little pillow and sleeping bag set. If you're going to be in there, you could be in there for a while. Look, the bathroom floor is not the most comfortable place to sleep, so you want to make sure that if you're going to be in there for hours, you're not going to come out of it with a lot of back and shoulder pain and things from sitting on a hard floor for hours and hours. Absolutely. Yeah. And it might not be a bathroom in your home. Yeah. It could be somebody's closet, for example. Yes. So so check out your home. I can't help but notice as we walk around the property that all the trees are trimmed really well. I don't see loose palm fronds. I don't see any coconuts on these trees. You know what? I, I'm so glad you brought that up because yeah. people don't realize that it's, they need to take some ownership of their property yeah. and, and make those things safe on their property. Removing coconuts is a perfect example. Anything that's loose like that becomes a projectile in a storm. So yeah. if you can do that maintenance today and remove things like coconuts and dead palm fronds, it'll save you from potential damage. Since we have a small pool here, I just want to talk about this quickly because I've done a number of stories on pools. Uh, when a storm is approaching, obviously there's a lot of rainfall, you do want to drain your pool level a bit, but you don't want to empty the pool. And that's something that a lot of pool companies and pool
pool builders have talked to me about because when you empty the pool then there's no weight to the pool there's no water weighing it down and if water manages to get underneath the structure that is the pool when it's empty that water can lift the pool right out of the ground crack the concrete i've seen that a bunch of times well, yeah and, and you know what it has a great post-storm yeah. resource for you yeah. in water that you can utilize to flush toilets and do things that you may can use that pool water for so yep. it's a really important resource for you in a, in a disaster. So I used to captain boats for a living and I, I have done stories in the past about how to tie your boat up properly in case of a storm but truth be told the best way to take care of your boat during a storm is to take it out of the water. The boat is in the water today because mm -hmm. it's a beautiful, you know, summer day. You want to use your boat as much as possible. But they have their trailer here located right here on the side of their home. But this homeowner has taken extra measures to concrete in chains. Wow. Right next to their trailer on the front and the back of the trailer area. So they can then strap down their trailer with the boat on it to ensure it the movement of this is minimal. What are some things you should do if you have a really nice whole house generator like this to make sure it's ready to go for hurricane season? Well, general maintenance is so important. You wanna make sure that you're maintaining a system, although it's automatic and, and starts on its own, you need to make sure that the company is maintaining it or somebody's maintaining it. Mm -hmm. Also, as you'll notice, whether you have a, an in-home generator that automatically turns on or you have a portable one, yeah. you wanna make sure that you keep it the appropriate distance away from your soffits, windows, any ventilation going into the house. You wanna eliminate those fumes getting into your home. Mm -hmm. So it's really important for the placement of a generator as well. It needs to be away from your home. Obviously, when you look around this home, they have a lot of beautiful patio furniture it's best to move this inside somewhere when a storm is approaching. Correct. This homeowner actually clears out everything, whether it be chairs, barbecue grills, you want to put those indoors so they don't become projectiles in the, yeah. in, a, in the event of a storm. Anything that you can physically move with your hands, the wind can move as well. We really d dug into our plans and rebuild our recovery plan. Next, the lessons learned after Hurricane Ian. Plus, the supplies you're going to need to stock up on right now. Hey everybody, I'm meteorologist Sandra Shaw, and we're talking about the tornadoes that are wrapped in those outer squalls around a hurricane, usually in that northeast right quadrant, and they spin up when it tries to make landfall because of the velocity and the momentum when it spins toward land. A lot of times they're rain wrapped and on the lighter side, but you can really see a clear swath of destruction in the aftermath of a hurricane if there were tornadoes there. Perhaps you remember Irma, 46 tornado warnings in South Florida alone. We were on the wall the entire time we felt like, but for you go back to Hurricane Ivan in 2004, 120 tornadoes, 103 with Hurricane Francis back in 2004.
As we prepare for hurricane season, you may have heard that our global weather pattern is shifting a little bit. We are tracking a developing El Nino, and basically what that means is the warming of the Pacific. So that means that we will see more wind shear when it comes to the Atlantic. If that is available, that means that wind shear can help kind of tear storms apart, which is good news. So. As we take a look at the hurricane forecast and the season, we are looking at a season that could be slightly below average here across the area, but I want to point this out. Very important that it only takes one storm, so get prepared. Colorado State University released their first Atlantic hurricane season forecast last month. They're predicting the first below average season since 2015. The reason? El Nino. They are predicting 13 named storms, six hurricanes, and two becoming major hurricanes. And experts believe we could see a major hurricane making landfall in the U.S. this season. City officials in Martin County have learned a lot of lessons from Hurricane Ian. Meteorologist Sandra Shaw shows us how what happened here can help us now. This is the communication nexus for storm operations in Martin County. And we have Unified Command, which is a group of decision makers that make decisions on when to evacuate, when to shelter, when to close the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center, and all the activities that, that go with making sure that everybody's safe during a hurricane. This is our Unified Command Center. This is where our county administrator sits, who is our incident commander, our fire chief, emergency management director. These are the people that make the decisions. All the information routes through the EOC, which strategizes throughout a hurricane. This is our broadcast studio. Mission number one, get clear messaging to the public, many times through news conferences in their recently remodeled media room. But outreach is happening right now as well. This new trailer is the distribution center for evacuation maps for residents who have never weathered a hurricane before. Oh, I do live in an evacuation zone. You know, what do I do? And we're really just giving out new information. We bought a, just purchased a bunch of new outreach um, supplies so we can just really just get the residents to be prepared that haven't been through a hurricane. They've been through snowstorms and blizzards, but this is a little bit different. Another key focus this year emerged from a recovery mission in Fort Myers right after Hurricane Ian. I flew over the devastated area, especially in Fort Myers Beach, and, and just looking at that really just makes you come back. And, and we really d dug into our plans and rebuilt our recovery plan and working on disaster housing plans and how we can get all of those FEMA housing trailers into this county if that happened. So to the left here, is our community information center. Also where all the hotline numbers are, are answered. Sally Waite has honed in on crafting specifics. We really we're looking into what can we really use, you know, what hotels can we have contracts with, you know, going to start working with our tourism development committee and see what, you know, what they have to offer up and just where are we going to put everybody? Are we going to put FEMA trailers on your lot? You know, just do you have permits for that? There was just so many, so many things that we learned from, from being over there. For now, the Martin County EOC is training emergency center staff. They are stocking up on their new freezer for the possible 24-7 demands ahead. And they are getting neighbors prepped for all possible outcomes. When people call, what are they most concerned about? Straight ahead, special needs shelters on the Treasure Coast. What you need to do to make sure you secure a spot at the number you can call for help 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'm WPBF 25 first warning meteorologist Brooke Silvering and here's your storm short. Here are some myths you might have heard of throughout the hurricane season. A category one hurricane is not that bad and that's not true. All it takes is one storm to cause damage and category one hurricanes can cause damage to roofs. Myth number two is just because the sun is out during a hurricane, it must mean the storm is over. And that's not true. The eye of a hurricane can be up to 20 to 40 miles wide, giving the illusion that it's over, but it's not technically over until you get the clear. And myth number three, just because you live by the water, you're going to be the only areas impacted by the storm. And that's not true. Areas further inland can also see impacts from the storm, such as storm surge and also flooding caused by heavy rains.
I'm First Warning Meteorologist Glenn Glazer, and this is your Storm Short on Storm Shutters. I've incorporated uh, the help of my very good friend, Dave Highland. Hello, Dave. Hey, what's up? Thanks for letting us use your house today. You've got one shutter down here. Uh, one thing that I found over the years, the most important thing before you put up your shutters is to get organized. Absolutely. We, we like to lie our, our shutters out by numbers Okay. in each corresponding window, and then we just take them there when it's ready and put them up. Pop so you got a tin full of wing nuts. You yep. have one shutter here. You see the number on it, number seven. So yep, yep. you know, exactly where that goes so on your house. So it's good to have extra wing nuts too because they break sometimes. You know? They break sometimes, they go missing. Have your gloves on. These are very sharp. Make yes. sure you use and gloves all the time. And shoes as Clo well. Oh, closed toed shoes as well. Another tip. I didn't think of that. Slide the shutter in right over the hole. Get a wing nut ready to go. I have the wing nut. Put it on here. Just kind of screw it in a little bit and then Dave has this handy dandy tool that attaches to his drill there, a little fitting. Boom. It's on. How long do you think it takes? So you have the layered shutters. Some people have the solid one window shutters. How long does it take to do your whole house? Uh, our house being a single story house, it only takes us about half an hour. So it's not too bad. We have the lightweight aluminum shutter so yeah. we can get around pretty quickly. People in the neighborhood jump in and help each other out. Yeah, anytime this is happening, uh, you know, all these people have two story houses so I get the raw end of the deal. But you know, <laughs> we, we definitely help each other, you know, make sure everybody's safe. So. All right, thanks brother. I appreciate your time today. I appreciate it. Glove handshake. That's yeah. right. All right. right, that's a look at storm shutters. Now to Indian River County, where the population has grown more than 10%. So that has emergency managers trying to accommodate the surge of people. Meteorologist Vanessa Vanette is in Vero Beach. This right here is the Indian River County Emergency Operations Center, and this is the main operations room that we use during activations for hurricanes and really any other local disaster. Emergency Management Coordinator Ryan Lloyd is always looking out for what the community may need. And that could include the needs to shelter, um, any sort of evacuation needs, um, and any sort of resources that we might need ahead of the storm that we need to get pre-positioned. When people call, what are they most concerned about? They're usually concerned about, do I have to evacuate? Is it going to storm? Is the lights gonna go out? And how long is the power gonna be out? If you're new to Florida, you need to know if you live in a flood or storm surge zone area. This is a storm surge map. Um, our main areas of storm surge is anything east of US-1 and there's also low-lying areas within the community. During a storm, damage isn't mostly caused by wind, it's by flooding. My role in this county is I'm in charge of various divisions, uh, one of which is the Emergency Management Division. Indian River Emergency Operations Service Director David Johnson wants to make sure people are prepared. Do the phones get flooded before or even more after the storm? Usually before, then they quiet down during the storm, then after the storm they pick back up. The Emergency Information Center is where anyone can call with questions about any disaster we're facing. If you have questions or need to evacuate, pet-friendly shelters are available. Special needs shelters will also be open and offer transportation. They can call the Emergency Operations Center here at 772-226-3900 and put their name on the list. Don't wait until a hurricane is headed your way to make a plan. I mean, look at this devastation. It's uncomprehensible. If you ever find yourself in a situation like these folks here in Matt Lachey, the best number to call is 211. The specially trained staff can answer your hurricane questions and direct you to the right people. 211 services are offered in all five of our counties, and they also offer mental health services. We'll have as many as 100 people in here. Coming up, emergency operations on a whole new level and what to do with your beloved pets during a storm. I'm here with Mary Blakeney with the Palm Beach County Emergency Management Office. What do you need to have in your disaster preparedness kit? You should have a three to five day supply of items within your disaster supply kit. You wanna have personal hygiene items, including any prescription medication. You wanna have non-perishable food. That's items that you can pull right out of your pantry and eat right out of the can if necessary. Remember, remember a can opener. And how many days of food? three to five days supply. You wanna have paper products, that way you don't have to worry about doing any type of dishes. You should have a supply of cash on hand. 
the medical information as well as emergency contacts. When it comes to drinking water, you wanna have one gallon per person per day. Again, three to five days. Don't forget the infants and children and the pets. And you wanna also have a supply of activities for the children to have available. And everything you have in your kit should be battery operated. No candles, you wanna have everything battery operated. So you can buy battery operated candles, extra batteries, a battery operated um, radio, and then some basic tools in the event you may need to do a last minute repair in your home. You're watching a WPPF 25 first warning weather special, hurricane ready. Welcome back. I'm Chief Certified Meteorologist Chris Martinez. I'm in the new Matt Lachey Menagerie, which is a gift shop and artist gallery all rolled into one. The old location, which was across the street, totally damaged, demolished by Hurricane Ian. I saw the damage a week after myself. Let's turn to meteorologist Glenn Glazer in St. Lucie County, where they're utilizing the latest technology in the Emergency Operations Center. So this is our Douglas M. Anderson Emergency Operations Center. It's named after our former county administrator, Doug Anderson, who was our administrator during Francis and Jean. Just off of Midway Road near the fairgrounds in St. Lucie County stands an amazing structure. Our old EOC didn't have sleeping quarters or showers or bunks, so this has all that and more. It's the St. Lucie County Emergency Operations Center, and it's from here that the county orchestrates everything to keep its residents safe during hurricane season. 
This is our media press room. Oh, this is a room I think a lot of people are familiar with have when seen, they watch TV during correct. storms. Yeah, they, They've probably seen the county administrator, chief of police, the sheriff all uh, speak from the podium here and give our messages. Some of these rooms may look familiar to you from watching TV during past storms. And some of them, like the operations center itself, you may not have ever seen before. Which is where, you know, we'll have as many as 100 people in here from the utility agencies, um, state, our health department, our volunteers, our PIOs, the law enforcement agencies will all be in here. And there are a lot of maps. Basically, we're our shelters, our uh, staging areas, points of distribution, evacuation routes, so it's kind of a comprehensive county map. But there are some things that can't be done from here. They are things that you have to do yourself to keep your loved ones safe, like having a plan. What I mean by plan is making sure you know if you have to evacuate, where are you guys going to evacuate? Uh, make sure that we know, that you, that the family knows what kind of items are going to be needed for a emergency kit. And just discussing if, you know, points of contact outside of the area that is, is being threatened by a hurricane. Is your home near an evacuation zone? Because that part can be a bit tricky. What's really interesting about it is people always think that the first evacuation zone is just along the coast, but I notice you have some other areas that are farther inland Absolutely. that are also first evacuation zones. So yes, we do have the San Lucie River. So you, as you can see, some of the uh, red, which is uh, evacuation zone A, mm -hmm. falls on the east side of, uh, of the San Lucie River. And make sure you know where the closest shelter is located to your home, whether it's general public, pet friendly, or special needs, which requires one extra step. Obviously, it's by registration, so we do, again, ask that people go to our website, stlucyco.org forward slash EOC, under special needs uh, shelter, and register ahead of time, uh, so that way we can have uh, uh, availability for our special needs shelter. The good news is, thanks to technology, it's easier than ever to get emergency information texted to you right on your phone. That's the Alert St. Lucy uh, app that we have for the phones, and they can sign up. And obviously, if there's any weather alerts, any type of emergency notification that uh, the Public Safety Department of the county has to uh, relate to our residents, we use that application to uh, let them know. For more St. Lucie County information, be sure to download the Disaster Preparedness Guide from the county website because... It's never too early to prepare for hurricane season. It's something that must be done every, every chance that you get. When a storm does come and an evacuation is issued, the Florida Department of Transportation will execute its emergency shoulder use plan. Drivers would be allowed to use the shoulder lanes on I-95 between Jupiter and Jacksonville, the turnpike between Hypoluxo to Osceola Parkway in Kissimmee, and I-75 between Broward to Collier Counties. All drivers except trailers, buses, and large trucks can use the shoulders. In the chaos, people will try to cash in on a natural disaster. Write down this number, 1-866-966-7226. It's to report any person or business you suspect of price gouging. Some of the most common price gouging complaints are about gas, water, plywood, and other necessary hurricane supplies. We're working on the drainage, but they still flood. Ahead, the biggest concerns facing people living in Okeechobee. Plus, the simple way you can find out if you're in a flood zone. If you're preparing for, during, and after a storm, you have to make sure you have a lot of things for your pet to keep them safe. You want to make sure if you're going to a shelter that they allow animals in the first place, or if you're evacuating to a hotel, that they also allow you to bring your furry friends. If you are packing for your pet, make sure you have three days worth of supply, three days worth of water, three days worth of food, something for them to eat their food out of, and also you want to make sure that you have the right medication to keep your pet safe in case of an emergency after the storm.
I'm meteorologist Vanessa Vinent, and here's your storm short. We're going to be talking about watches and warnings. When a watch has been issued, that means be prepared, a warning, take action right now. Let's talk about tropical storm watches and warnings. A tropical storm watch means tropical storm conditions are possible within 48 hours, and a tropical storm warning means tropical storm conditions are expected within 36 hours. That means winds over 39 miles per hour up to 73. Hurricane advisories, hurricane watches mean hurricane conditions are possible within 48 hours and a hurricane warning are expected within 36 hours. That means hurricane force winds basically 74 miles per hour or even higher, meaning category one to a five. Now to Okeechobee in Florida's heartland, home to more than 40,000 folks and it has more of a small town feel. Meteorologist Brooke Silverang is here to let us know how the county made history. This is the historic hurricane of 1928. It's actually called the Okeechobee Hurricane. It made landfall over the West Palm Palm Beach area. And then it went across the state over Lake Okeechobee. And I understand one of the biggest you know, threats was flooding mm -hmm. from the lake. Since 2011, the Army Corps has made more than $870 million in improvements to the Herbert Hoover Dyke to reduce the risk of catastrophic failure. They put that dike up there was my understanding to keep that from happening again. With the, with the flooding and the storm surge. Earl Wooden will be wearing two hats this year, public safety director, and he's now the new fire chief. We've been uh, training, getting ready for the upcoming storm season uh, with different trainings with the county uh, workers that'll be working in the EOC, with the, what's called our web EOC. Uh, we've been training with our uh, uh, local building department officials for Orion, which is our damage assessment uh, programs and things will go out after the storm and, and assess the damage that, that may have occurred from the storm. In here, this is where all our different uh, emergency support functions take place um, and our uh, command and general staff when we have our meetings for hurricanes and things like that. Everybody's just kind of in here working away. Okeechobee County's Emergency Operations Center will be fully staffed before, during and after a storm in a building which can withstand winds up to 156 miles per hour. Even with taking a direct lightning strike, you know, we were able to maintain power and be able to provide you know, the services to the community continue to talk to the state without any issues. We had our internet. Since Okeechobee County is in the center of the state, it feels the impacts from hurricanes that make landfall on Florida's east and west coast. The biggest issues that, that I've seen over time with us comes back to that street flooding. The areas that are typically prone, you know, low-lying areas there in the lake. I mean, we have our same areas. Uh, we're working on the drainage, but they still flood. Next, storm surge in virtual reality. What a popular local city could look like underwater. Hey everybody, I'm meteorologist Sandra Shaw and this is your Storm Short on Storm Names. Your 2023 list is here. It's a list that's recycled every six years unless a storm name is retired. But who in the world comes up with this list? Actually, a branch of the United Nations known as the International Committee of World Meteorological Organization uh, at least it's easier to say these names than that. But I can tell you that they have been doing this since 1953. It's an alphabetical order. You have a male name and a female name, and then it rotates. Interesting to note that a study was done on this about 10 years ago, and the most destructive storms were the female names, but yet the most feared storms were the male names.
I'm first warning meteorologist Glenn Glazer, and this is your Storm Short on Storm Surge. What is Storm Surge? Well, when a developed storm is out in the ocean, it does a couple of things. The low pressure center lifts the water up, but the wind is what really causes storm surge, and that's blowing forward a wall of water as it heads toward land. For example, let's suppose this Tupperware has the ocean in it, and I am the wind. As it blows forward, the water piles up. Now, let's suppose I'm standing at high tide here on the beach. That means where I'm standing is exactly where the water comes to at high tide. Now, let's suppose there's a four foot storm surge. This ladder is four feet tall. So in the same spot where I was just standing at high tide, the water would be up to here on me. How about an eight foot storm surge? Well, let's take our tape measure and see. The ladder is four feet. Let's go another four feet. Look at that, the top of the tape measure that's an eight foot storm surge. Imagine how far inland that water would go. This map of Florida from the National Hurricane Center shows it's not just a beachfront problem. The risk extends miles inland from the immediate coastline in some areas. You can check your risk by going to our website, WPBF.com. And the city of West Palm Beach is taking the storm surge threat a step further. Meteorologist Brooke Silverang shows us what a wall of water could look like in virtual reality. I'm meteorologist Brooke Silvering, and I'm standing here in Osprey Park. This is one of the areas highlighted by Florida Atlantic University and Virtual Planet to show what could happen if a hurricane were to make landfall in this area. The simulation focuses on city parks in the historic Northwood neighborhood. This is all because of sea level rise, king tides, and the effects of water being pushed on shore from a hurricane. The project was designed for developers to plan ahead or even come up with solutions to prevent what could happen from actually happening. Some solutions would be to make higher sea walls or by creating more man-made islands that act like a buffer against storm surge. I'm meteorologist Vanessa Vinens and here is your storm shorts about rapid intensification. So what is rapid intensification? That basically means when a hurricane is moving over the very warm waters with very low wind shear, that means the environment is very favorable. It will get stronger, sustain winds anywhere between 35 miles per hour, even higher within a 24 hour period. So it could go from a category one hurricane to a three or even a category three hurricane to a five in just one day. So that will lead to high storm surge, stronger winds, lots of rain, and also the catastrophic flooding in certain areas.
One of the ways that you can get your family hurricane ready is by going to our website, WPBF.com. Click on the WPBF 25 First Warning Hurricane Ready Guide. Meteorologist Vanessa Vanette has all the life-saving information. The hurricane guide is packed with useful storm advice. Let's begin with what to do before and after a storm when a hurricane watch or warning is issued. Make sure you have a family plan. There is a checklist to review. One of those important tasks, fill up your car with gas. You'll also find tips on staying safe during a storm. For example, keep in mind during a hurricane, be alert for tornadoes. And make sure the storm has completely passed before going outside. A useful feature, what to pack when you're evacuating, such as prescriptions, important documents, and chargers. Also in the guide, a list of shelters for each county, including pet-friendly or special needs shelters too. You can find everything on WPBF.com. If a storm hits and you aren't near your TV or you lose power, we're committed to keeping you informed. You can listen to our live coverage on our trusted radio partners listed right there on your screen. I covered Hurricane Ian since day one, and to come back months later and still see so much devastation on this island is still so emotional to see. Lots of rebuilding to go, but this community is so resilient. And always remember, we'll be with you before, during, and after a storm. From Matt Lachey, I'm Chief Certified Meteorologist Chris Martinez.